Good Morgen, meine Brüder und Schwestern. This is an Obery Project investigative video series, Joseph Smith and the Kabbalah, Part 8, King Follett and the Revolution. I'm your host, John McTemus. It is 5.45 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on March 7th in the year 2019, we're told. I do warn you, it is another cold one today. So the space heater is in f at full blast uh, for anyone who notices any kind of background noise, which I try to keep the uh, Blue Yeti, which I think is probably one of the finest microphones for anybody who's trying to record directly to computer with some kind of clarity and quality. But um, I try to keep it set at uh, a diaphragm closure rate that keeps out most of that background noise. So hopefully I'm uh, doing what I, I, I had hoped to accomplish with that. <clears throat> now, with the, uh, the subtle clearing in the last 24 hours of the chemo fog uh, helped out tremendously uh, in the fact that it was yesterday morning when I had to take my last dose of heavy, heavy prednisone um, that has to be taken after you receive an infusion of CHOP chemo. Uh, between the prednisone and what they call chemo fog, um, what happens is you're, you're, you're so limited in what you can accomplish, unfortunately. The the prednisone keeps you not only physically incapacitated in the sense of bloating and, you know, if you're not ADD, which I'm not, um, you become very ADD. You have to keep a leash on your uh, emotions, uh, you know, anger and frustration, uh, things like that. And um, it's basically delivering uh, or, or causing a lot of, um, I suppose, adrenal activity. And so you don't sleep well either. I mean, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, but when, when that's over and the fog is beginning to clear, it's like night and day. It's, uh, it's pretty wonderful. But so in the last day, I've been thinking a lot um, about the series so far and what's been the intent. And, you know, I, I keep up on a lot of other people, a lot of other researchers, uh, a lot of purported expositors and so-called journalists, and some real journalists and expositors, figures, social media heavily, and... Uh, and academics too, of all levels. I keep up on everything I can. And I know that based on the spirit of the age and the way in which certain people are attempting to and accomplishing the moving of what they call laws and mentalities and the way they stir the pot and the way they've been doing that for a long time and they're good at it they know that they are also concerned and it is why certain things are happening the way they are happening it's why <clears throat> it's why social media has been doing the the flip-flop that they were that, that they were all designed to do from the start. I know that in the course of my life, however long the Father deems it to be, I will be accused of many things. Uh, some will probably be correct. Many of them will not. The one thing I do hope that at least those who are honest will accuse me of is a passion 
for truth and sincerity. Um, that they could say he was someone who would not use subtleties. He would not use charisma. He would not use any command that he might have of vocabulary or any language to direct the thoughts of a listener in any possible way but the pursuit of truth and in getting truth the knowledge of our only only true Alayim God and his Mashiach called Christ. And when you consider the fact that Yusho called Christ, he did claim, and I believe him, that he is the way, the truth, the life, the definite article. So when he says the truth, that means everything that is true is of importance and pertains to him. It all falls under his auspices. He's the authority. He was deemed the authority. He was granted this by the Father. So, you know, in light of various people that I've been having, you know, different interactions with and considering the way that a lot of my rhetoric might be taken and the way that it might be twisted, I thought it was a really good idea to, to start with a quote, and I'm not going to heavily exposit because I don't want to give you the answer. I really keep a leash on that in a number of ways. I mean, you know, sarcasm, joking, um, satirical banter, and other questions aside, the, the point is to get to the heart of the truth in everything. So, with the subject matter that I have to broach in these videos that I do, and because I can't deny what I can see in history, I can't deny what I can see in our own day, um, however unpleasant the truth often seems, and whether or not I interpret it correctly, let it be known this. I pay close attention to the words and the deeds of Yusho, because he's my master, and I want to emulate him. I want to be exactly like him. As much as that is possible, we should walk as he walked, as John said in 1 John. So I was reading in Luke as uh, I try to spend time going through parables um, because there's so much of a wealth in parables. It's probably not what we usually think of when we think of like parable classes or teachings that we would get at uh, the local church corp. Um, and I was in Luke 8. And I had to read one of the parables in there and consider it. And there's two passages because the parable of the sower is earlier. And then after that, he repeats a statement that he's made in, in other books. We can see it in the other synoptics about no one lighting a lamp and putting it under a basket or sticking it under a bed. He puts it up high for that light to shine on all who come in. Again, hearkening back to the truth. If you have the truth, if you have 
understanding, you've got knowledge and wisdom, and it is the truth, or, or it is as best as you can grasp onto what is truth about it, you light it and you put it high up. And many people that are not in the light may hate you for doing that. Many are going to hate you, first off, for shining a light on things. The way that I and many others shine a light on history, what's happening currently, um, many facets about the word of truth that nobody else wants to talk about because they're not expedient for them, they're not expedient for their careers, or they're not expedient for their comfort zone. But we have to do it because we've been made in a way in which we cannot do anything but. Like the prophet Jeremiah said, the word of Yahweh is like a fire inside my belly. And if I should try to suppress it, it would consume me. It's so painful to hold it in. So at a point, Yusha's going through these villages and cities. And as the English rendering of the Greek says, that he was preaching the kingdom of God, or Yahweh, Aliyim. And he had cleansed many women of uh, what they call demons. I don't know what to make of that yet. I'm sorry. Now, he tells the parable because there are throngs of crowds. And the Greek even puts it in that way. <clears throat> Paulus, it's, you know, these throngs of people. It doesn't specify Jew. Uh, or Samaritan, the mixed multitude, Canaanites, throngs of people are amassing around him. And of course, this was the state of just about everywhere he went in his ministry. Because usually people wanted to either see, they see the signs and miracles, they wanted the signs and miracles, they wanted the benefits. And he himself said, you know, that it's mostly that's what people would come for. But it didn't stop him from being compassionate, from healing, feeding, forgiving sins of those whose faith had made them whole. And so he embraced <clears throat> many crowds. He spent a good deal of time amongst many crowds, and of course he was typically thronged by crowds. He had just told the parable of the sower, and he had explained this to his close inner twelve. And he had told them that the reason that he would speak typically to crowds and in other mixed companies like scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and so on is because he said to them, because it's given you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but not them. Now, after he repeats his statement about lighting a lamp, nobody lights it, puts it under a basket, they place it up high. He says, there, there is nothing that is done in the dark that will not be revealed by the light, and we can take him at his word. Nothing, none of these hidden works of darkness will remain hid. They're all going to be exposed by the light. So, at this point in speaking, it says in Luke 19, his mother and brothers came to him and they could not come near him because of the crowd. So some people told him, quote, your mother and your brothers stand outside desiring to see you, unquote. But he answered them, quote, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God, Yahweh, and do it. So, for me, and maybe for you, that begs the question. Is he saying <clears throat> that our genetic familial 
connections are meaningless. In contrast to a very real, very meaningful spiritual family connection. Is he, is he literally making a black and white? The reason I ask is because what I've been witnessing since I've been doing this series and I promise you guys when I'm not reading and digging into everything I can about Mormonism and trying to to get to the heart of what's really going on so I'm not I'm not spending extensive time reading the I think the stuff really for public cons consumption, whether it's apologetics or polemics, no, um, the stuff you gotta you gotta read between the lines and, and dig that that sort of stuff. Trying to find and listen to any video I can by 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 people that seem more trustworthy, people who seem less trustworthy, um, and I go through a lot. I hear a lot. And I've mentioned twice now this program that was produced for a long time from Salt Lake City by a guy who said that he was, I haven't heard any different, I, I assume that his claims are correct, um, that he was a lifelong Mormon, that he had a very intimate knowledge of, of, of many, many, many of the inner workings of the Mormon church, and that he had left uh, the Mormon organization, I should call it, and uh, was now a, a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, uh, probably not, you know, without denomination. Now, I remember, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, I think his name was Sean, I know he had an Irish last name. Uh, and I've, I've listened to a lot of his broadcasts that he did. And, of course, he would have callers in, and he would confront callers. Um, and the way that he would oftentimes speak of and I can understand, I can understand because of how protective I am of my people and, that, and those who I know um, within the church and within church corporations who I know I know are of my family, just, just like Yusho said here when he's distinguishing, okay? Uh, so I'm not just talking about my, my, my blood family, my flesh family, and, and my, my Germanics people. I'm talking about my people people. I'm very, very protective of them. And I will just assume that he is too or was to, you know, in these broadcasts. I'll, I'll assume that. And, and that that's why he was so combative in the way that he was, and oftentimes extraordinarily uh, sarcastic about, because he believed that most people that would call were liars. A lot of them did strike me as liars, um, a lot of them were, were trying very hard to not answer questions of his and protect either their LDS doctrines or temple secrets or something else. So I get it. I get it. I get why. And it's, it was television. So when you're producing television, which is, you know, it, 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 television was night and day different than, than what I can do here. All right, I, I can make a recording, a, a podcast. I can make it, I can make it forty-six minutes and thirty-eight seconds, <laughs> like your typical hour spot is for television, right? Allowing for commercial, depending on what time of day it is. <laughs> or I can make it an hour and a half. I can make it two hours. Good night, man. Some people go on for five and a half straight hours. So, it's a different medium. And so I understand when he does what he does, when he did what he did then, there would be a certain emphasis on getting things in in a timely manner, and that would cause certain types of dynamics. 
I figured him at first, though, for drawing that night and day line. Wherein, if you were not him who heard the word of Yahweh and did it, that essentially you were nothing to him. In contrast to those who did, no matter who they were, no matter who they were. Now, if that's the case, and the reason I would say that is because that is a mindset that most people have in Christendom today, is that it is that much of a black and white issue. That you're either, you either are this, or you're nothing. Maybe not nothing. Am I, am I going too far by saying nothing? But it certainly seems that way, because here's why. He would talk to people. He, he rarely had call-ins that were officials. Well, I don't know if he ever had call-ins that were officials, because the officials, they're not going to call in, and I know why. He said why. Well, of course, it makes all the sense in the world, because an official in the LDS church when they answer questions, they have to either distinguish whether they are giving their opinion or feelings, or if he asks them a direct question concerning LDS teaching, they have to answer truthfully in regards to those official documents concerning official teaching. So I get that. If, if you're somebody who just... Um, you're just somebody in the LDS church. You, you can call in and, and you can say anything you want. You can lie and, and you're not going to be held accountable, not in the way, not in the way that an official would. So the, so the thing is, most of it would, would have just been typical LDS people. And the problem was that the interaction that I picked up on most of the time, everything I've heard so far, has been one of a combative nature that makes me think that he would take a passage like this and apply it in the sense of, if you're not those who hear the word of Yahweh and do it, and I would have to imagine that is based on what his current understanding of that was, by the way. Do you see that extra problem in all of this? It would also be based on his current understanding. And, and I told you about those people who leave LDS Mormon and how now they have this whole uh, journey of getting that Judeo-sizing, that Philo-Judaism out of them, too, in addition to, to all the Mormon things that are taught to them, which it's all blended together so badly. So that now they have their own idea of what it means that hearing the word of Yahweh and doing it. So if he's thinking like that, it makes me think that he's looking at it black and white. If you aren't what I deem this passage to mean, Luke 8, 21, you're nothing. You're you're either that and you're my family, no matter what. And I don't, how do you always determine that? So does it, it doesn't matter who comes along, their background, their, their whatever. If they make that claim, are you supposed to instantly decide they are more family to you than those people who you have closer or not as close genetic links to. What do I mean by that? My closest genetic link, my children and my wife. Next closest, the family I was born into. Next, the, the ring outside of that. Second cousins, third cousins, you know, great uncles, all of that. Now, you keep going those concentric rings and you have Germanics. You keep doing those concentric rings and you have Anglo-Saxons, you have Celts. Do you understand what I'm saying? Of course you do. 
is he saying that if you're not hearing the word of Yahweh and doing it, you're nothing? Because I want to contextualize that with many other statements he made. Like, for instance, I've come for naught but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He speaks to the Canaanite woman and he said, It is not good to give the children's bread unto the dogs. He tells his disciples, Go into no city of the Samaritan, the Shomrani, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Yisrael. Paul, Romans 9 through 11, he longed for his brethren after the flesh because he loved his brethren after the flesh. Why did he love his brethren after the flesh? Was it because he was a national socialist? Or was it because it's naturally built in us to love our brethren after the flesh? That there's nothing wrong with that. We have to get far, far beyond the message of it's okay to be white and get to the point of it is a natural thing to love and care for your brethren after the flesh. Starting with that closest ring, like I just mentioned, with the concentric rings going out. That is natural. Not natural, in natural, bad, sinful natural, that kind of, uh, whatever, Augustinian thing, I have no idea. Anyways, natural as in built in, like our, our propensity to do things that preserve our loved ones and ourselves' lives. That's a natural thing. You see, it's built in. It's built in. So, if we go against that in our behaviors, our actions, our speech, we are behaving unnaturally, abominably. If we quite literally will look at those people who are concentrically close to us in that way as though they are nothing and then decide that our perception of those who hear the word of Yahweh and do it is correct, and only treat them as our family. Is that the correct way to look at it? Night and day, it's one or the other. Or is the correct way to look at it <clears throat> that Yusha was making a point before these crowds and in front of the twelve People who he had just said concerning that light and shining that light. He had just spoken these words to him. Nothing's hidden, he said, that won't be revealed or anything secret that won't come into the light. And then he warned him. He said, be careful. Be careful how you hear. He's telling them to listen up. Hear. Hear what he says. He says, whoever has to him will be given, and whoever doesn't have, from him will be taken even that which he thinks he has. And then somebody comes and says, your mother and brothers, they stand outside, they desire to see you, so they wanted him, they, they, they want him to be pulled away from what he's doing and go and talk to them, okay? And he's making a point then when that happens and says, My mother and brothers are those who hear the words of Yahweh and do them. Does that mean that those people standing outside, the, the woman who gave birth to him and his brothers after the flesh are nothing to him? See, I don't think he meant that. I think they were very much, of course, to him, his own mother and his brothers. And I think he would do a great deal to protect them 
to care for them, which he did. He entrusted his mother to his closest friend that he had on earth when he was dying. Because he knew even after he was resurrected, he wouldn't be here for that long. Cared for these people enormously. It wasn't a black and white thing. He was making a point, I believe, to the people around him who he was just preaching to. Because it was a deeper spiritual meaning and message, exactly like Paul said when he said how much he longed for his brethren after the flesh. However, not all who are Israel after the flesh are of the Israel who are the elect. He's whittling them down. And of course we see that throughout the entire Old Testament, that there were actually just a minority of those people who were born after the flesh in Israel that were chosen, faithful, true, elect. And Paul gives example after example from Romans 9 through Romans 11 of this very thing. So in no way are we being taught that it is a matter of turning our back on our own people in that concentric ring sort of idea or reality, but simply that there is a higher family he speaks of, the real family he speaks of, not as though those people who are our concentric family after the flesh mean nothing, not even mean little, they should be extraordinarily important to us. And unfortunately, I think we've been programmed with this mindset that uh, through schisms in the church, uh, between Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, and then the Reformation, and then the thousands of monsters that that has spawned, that we get this idea that if I'm a Methodist and you are a Jehovah's Witness, the only way in which you are my brother is if you have the profession uh, I deem to be correct as per the words of Yusha or Jesus. And that the fact that you might be extremely close to me in literal, physical, genetic ways might mean nothing. Somebody has bred a mentality like that into the church, specifically into our racial group and groups of people to further divide us, confuse us, and cause us to be less loving and caring of one another as family, even if we might not have that same idea in mind concerning what you show was saying and the contrast he was making. So I hope that that helps first off anyone to uh, better understand where I'm coming from on the subject, uh, help you as well. And you know, if I thought it would give better clarity when uh, those who will accuse me one day uh, would, um, I would say that too, but it won't, because it won't matter. Those who will accuse me will do the same thing that uh, when they, and this with, with anybody, this is going to happen, they're going to use the same type of, of tricks and tactics that the, uh, the Pharisees and scribes used on you show uh, all throughout his ministry in the night of his uh, secret trial. So about 30 minutes in, which is usually where I cut off those 
opening statements, and whenever any of them uh, are of more weight, I give them more time, and that one was. And I try to get on with um, more of the bulk or heart of the series matter. Something that you have to understand in this series uh, is there are different reasons why we're going through it, different reasons why we're spending some time on portions of it. The first glaring one is the fact that no Mormon apologist that I know of has up to this time been as forthright concerning Smith and LDS doctrine in general's uh, associations with origins in potentials for heavy, uh, heavier than heavy, um, absolute links to Kabbalah. And I've explained to you Kabbalah, Kabbalah, everything I've come to know about it so far is old world Canaanite mysticism. It's all of those old uh, so-called Baal, Malachian, uh, Mardukian, you name him. Those religions, practices, beliefs, philosophies that worship, venerate, and practice disgusting practices for these gods who are not gods. The Kabbalistic aspect of it, and yes, as I've said before, and I'm going to say it again, because it's provable, Kabbalah and Kabbalism is specifically Jewish, proliferated by people who claim to be descendants of the house of Judah. That's what they mean when they say Jew. Can they prove it? Not a single one. That's why we need to look for the fruits told to us in Jeremiah 31, 33. However, Kabbalah is specifically Jewish. You want to you wanna learn about Kabbalah, you want to get a commentary on Kabbalah, you're going to go to somebody who calls themselves a Jew. Kabbalah is Jewish. Um, and we can see that... Um, all of the great movements that have influenced the world as we know it for centuries now that are based on beliefs and practices within Kabbalah. And remember, Kabbalah is a word that is a representation for a number of different writings, the most famous being the Zohar, um, and they'll also refer to Lurian Kabbalah. The Zohar, though, is really at the heart. And what we're going to see in the bit of what we read concerning King Follett discourse is going to be from the Zohar. Anyways, everything about it is Jewish. It's practitioners, Jewish. These people who are self-identified as Jews. This isn't debatable. So. As I told you, yes, Mormonism is already, LDS is already, admittedly, Philo-Jewish. That's true. But I think people tend to neglect how utterly steeped in this occult uh, practice of Kabbalah they are. Now, their, their rituals, their documents the way that they, they, they change things around as they wish, the fact that they have what they consider an Aaronic priesthood, and Cohen's can be, they'll let people in the, the Aaronic priesthood, they can be Cohen's. All you have to do is have the name Cohen, and you can basically ap apply for their bishoprics, uh, Aaronic priesthood. They, it's all Talmudic. 
I think that's something that, that we have to establish, that we've got uh, somewhere from an 11 to 15 million strong member, if, if those numbers are correct, maybe they're more than that. Um, Talmudic Jewish sleeper s sort of organization in our midst that goes by LDS, Mormon, Latter-day Saints. That's something that we, we need to extract from this and I think get that very solid in our heads. So there's, there's not really any argument left in that. Um, because then we can pursue things that are actually even weirder concerning what was going on here with these people in this nation at the time and who was behind it and its intent and I'm really just alluding to these things these are shadows but believe me there's way more to this than they ever release or talk about for if I may be so forward <laughs> the consumption of the goyim now I'm not going to go into what I believe that Smith was trying to absolutely accomplish in this discourse although although I think it was weighty and I think that just like all of the rest of Hermeticism that there is the exoteric and the esoteric and we're not just talking about theology and doctrine here folks we're talking about things far bigger think bigger and what do I mean by bigger think of how I talked about in that first extra video that I had made with the green cover at length about the Sabbatean and Frankist movements, revolutions, excuse me, both of them Lurianic Kabbalists, their revolutions and the expression of those things today in Chabad Lubavitch, uh, in a sense being a, a mirror to the way that uh, LDS has calmed its doctrines for public consumption to this day. Um, they were into all kinds of the same sorts of things that this group of Mormons were and the hierarchy were. Revolution, folks. I'm talking about revolutions. So you want to know what I'm thinking about the esoteric and exoteric to all of this. Revolution. Marx and Engel they're working on their Communist Manifesto right around this time. And you don't think mail and messengers were traveling? They are waging a military campaign. And wouldn't you know it, 20 brief years later, According to a contemporary historian whose many, many of her opinions I trust, not that all of them are perfect, but I think she has great insight, and that would be Deanna Spingola. She declares that the Civil War was in fact a communist revolution. And by everything that I've seen, I agree with her wholeheartedly. Now, if you pay attention to the observations of Richard Kelly Hoskins 
and others who were commenting on the racial tensions that were being fomented even at this time the from the early 1800s all the way up until the outbreak of the so-called Civil War you can see that there is a hidden hand behind all that now I guess some questions that are gonna have to be asked as we go is was this what was going on with Smith his group their activities and the scale of it all which really none of us have been given an idea of if it wasn't simply just a component in all of this not that I'm saying it was the first failed attempt at a revolution that was far more successful via the Civil War so-called Civil War but a very important component in the things that were designed to take place to accomplish a number of things let's let's stick it right there leave it there for now and just talk a little bit about the King Follett discourse in the sense of what it is that Smith quotes where it comes from and are we just going to float along with the sanitized Mormon story breeze that so many people have spoon-fed us especially the people who claim to be ex-Mormons who are now exposing Mormonism from without you have to understand that those are oftentimes the people I trust the least. They've been doing that one for a long time. You know, the whistleblower, the perceived whistleblower, is oftentimes the greatest disinformation agent. So, Owens gives us a, a portion of what came from the King Follett Discourse, which Smith was said to have delivered in 1844, not all that long before his death. Now, Owen says, The prophet begins his discussion of the plurality and hierarchy of the gods with an odd exegesis of the first words of Genesis, Bereshith bara aliyim. And, um, okay, for the sake of this, I'm going to pronounce these things in Hebrew and not Obri. Okay, here we go. And this is Smith. I suppose I'm not allowed to go into an investigation of anything that is not contained in the Bible. I will go to the Old Bible and turn commentator today. I will go to the very first Hebrew word, Bereshith in the Bible and make a comment on the first sentence of the history of creation quote in the beginning unquote I want to analyze the word Bereshith be in by through and everything else next Rosh the head eth where did it come from when the inspired man wrote it he did not put the first part the be there but a man a Jew without any authority put it there. He thought it too bad to begin to talk about the head of any man. It read in the first, quote, The head one of the gods brought forth the gods, unquote. This is the true meaning of the word Roshith, Bera, Elohim, signifies the head, to bring forth the Elohim. If you do not believe it, you do not believe the learned man of God. No learned man can tell you any more than what I have told you. Thus, the head God brought forth the head gods in the grand head council. 
By any literate interpretation of Hebrew, this is an impossible reading. Joseph takes Elohim, the subject of the clause, and turns it into the object, the thing which received the action of the creation, Bereshith, in the beginning, is reinterpreted to become Roshith, the head, or, quote, head father of the gods, unquote, who is the subject actor creating Elohim. And Elohim he interprets not as God, but as the gods. Louis C. Zucker, a Jew, who published an insightful examination of Smith's study and use of Hebrew, notes that this translation deviates entirely from the interpretive convention Joseph had learned as a student of Hebrew in Kirtland. Joshua Sixus, the professor who had instructed Joseph and the School of the Prophets in early 1836, used in his classes a textbook he had written, Hebrew Grammar for the Use of Beginners. In the Six Sixus Manual, page 85, this Hebrew text of Genesis 1-1 is given along with a, in quotes, correct word-for-word -word translation, quote, in the beginning he created God, the heavens, and the earth, unquote. <clears throat> Sixus would not have introduced in his oral instruction a translation entirely alien to the conventions of his own textbook. Zucker comments on Smith's strange translation of the verse, quote, Joseph, with audacious independence, changes the meaning of the first word and takes the third word, Elohim, as literally plural. He ignores the rest of the verse and the syntax he imposes on his artificial three-word statement is impossible. But Zucker, along with Mormon historians generally, ignored another exegesis of this verse, an exegesis which was a basic precept of Jewish Kabbalah from the 13th century on and which agrees word for word with Joseph's reading. In the tradition of Kabbalah, Bereshith bara Elohim was most emphatically not an, quote, artificial three-word statement, unquote, as Zucker implied. Gershom Sholem, in the middle of a long discussion, explains this other view. And by the way, folks, Gershom Sholem is basically looked to, to this day, as being like the authority on... Jewish mysticism. Okay, Gershom Sholem. He says, the Zohar, and indeed the majority of older Kabbalists, questioned the meaning of the first verse of the Torah. Bereshith bara Elohim, quote, in the beginning God created, unquote. What actually does this mean? The answer is fairly surprising. We are told that it means Bereshith through the medium of, quote, the beginning. The chokmah, or wisdom, the primordial image of the Father in the Kabbalistic Sephiroth. Bara, created, that is to say, the hidden nothing, which constitutes the grammatical subject of the word bara, emanated or unfolded. Elohim, that is to say, its emanation is Elohim. It Elohim is the object and not the subject of the sentence. Sholem's point is perhaps made clearer by restatement. In the Zohar and in the commentaries of the majority of older, that is, 13th and 14th century Kabbalists, the verse Bereshith bara Elohim is grammatically turned around. Bereshith is understood to refer to the sephira of Chokmah, translated as wisdom, and identified in Kabbalistic theosophy as the supernatural father, the figure who is usually interpreted in Kabbalah as the first of the Godhead. Chokmah then emanates or creates in the sense of unfolding the Elohim, as Sholem notes, the interesting thing here is that Elohim has become the object of the sentence and is no longer the subject. This is precisely Joseph Smith's reading.
Now, what I've done is I've brought up a page on which is the Sephiroth. I want, if you would, to take something away from this. What Mr. Owens is saying. What we just witnessed Smith say in the context of his King Follett discourse. Here's what I would like you to take away. We have, based on what he just said, and on what Mr. Owens has very aptly demonstrated to us, and now what we can see in the Sephiroth, and there is so much here, in just this very core idea in the Zohar, Kabbalah. What you need to understand is you've got two options. Either, as Mr. Owens has expressed profoundly, you can believe that Joseph Smith was such a magnanimous, pure prophet of the only true God, and that he literally was throughout his career simply expressing archetypes which we can also see expressed on through the ages through Kabbalah, Hermeticism, Alchemy, Rosicrucianism, etc. You either have Joe Smith, the great prophet of the only true Aliyim, Yahweh, expressing archetypes that we can also find in, of all places, Kabbalah. The same Kabbalah that has been the guide for, to, among others, uh, Sabbatai V, Jacob Frank, Chabad Lubavitch, Jewish and things non-assumed as Jewish mysticism for many, many centuries now. You either have this stuff being deeper, only true God-inspired truth. And Joe Smith was simply articulating as a prophet these archetypes. That's option one. Option two, Joe Smith in his King Follett discourse had a more extensive library provided by Niebauer, who in my opinion was of course not an, a random convert to Mormonism, but was an old world Jew who was assigned to Smith at this point in time, actually assigned to this militia, this great revolutionary force at this time. Smith, who I don't even really necessarily believe wrote this King Follett discourse, at this time had in his possession a far wider range of Kabbalistic sources. And again, I'm hard-pressed to believe that the man wrote any of this. Did he write in conjunction with Oliver Cowdery, um, what we know of as the Book of Mormon? I, that I am far more willing to believe. Did he have most of what was to do with like the Book of Abraham? Um, that I'm far more willing to believe. 
the doctor, uh, doc, um, <clears throat> doctrines and covenants, I'm far more willing to believe his um, participation in the writing of those documents than I am to believe in his participation in the writing of the King Follett Discourse. Um, I am more apt to believe that he was, for one thing, he was the front man here, and he was probably a very good speaker. I mean, whatever else you make of all of the different commentaries and or histories of his life, who he was, um, the fact that he was very convincing is, uh, I think it's, it's beyond dispute. So which is it? True prophet articulating an archetype of truth that can be found in a much earlier form in the Zohar, Kabbalah, in this Sephiroth design of theirs, which turns the idea of the one true Aliyum who created everything on its head and makes a sort of force, Luke, the force created it. If, if you read just a, an introduction on the Sephiroth <clears throat> and the initial ideas in the Zohar, it's got George Lucas all over it, or vice versa. So was it that, or was this sermon simply <laughs> taken from the only source it could be taken from? that we know of express the exact same ideas that he just expressed in the King Follett Discourse. It's one or the other. Now continuing with Mr. Owens. This interpretation of Genesis 1-1 is not deeply hidden in the Zohar, but constitutes its opening paragraphs and it is the central concern of the entire first section of this long book. The Zohar begins with a commentary on Bereshith bara Elohim. It is written, And the intelligent shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness like the stars for ever and ever. There was indeed a brightness the most mysterious struck its void and caused this point to shine. This beginning, Rashith, then extended and made, its, made for itself a palace for its honor and glory. Thus, by means of this beginning, Rashith, the mysterious unknown made this palace. This palace is called Elohim, and this doctrine is contained in the words, quote, by means of a beginning, Rashith, it created Elohim. So far, this is exactly Joseph Smith's reading. In his exegesis, Joseph takes Elohim, the subject of the clause, and turns it into the object which received the action of creation from the first God image, here called Rashith, just as does the Zohar. Indeed, his words as transcribed by William Clayton, quote, Roshit signifies to bring forth Elohim, unquote, are almost identical with the Zohar's phrasing of the interpretation. In his next step of translation, Smith interprets Bereshit to become Rosh, the head, or head god, as Zucker objected, orthodox standards of translation do not yield the word rosh, nor head, from Bereshit. But it was not, quote, audacious independence, unquote, alone that led Smith to change the meaning. A basis for this reading is actually found in the next verse of the Zohar. By a Kabbalistic cipher of letters, a technique used in Kabbalah to conceal deeper esoteric meanings. The Zohar explains that the word Rashith, quote, is anagrammatically Rosh, head, the beginning which issues from Rashith, unquote. 
To understand the fuller intent of this phrase, one must again remember that Rosh, or Rashith, is here interpreted by Kabbalah to be Chokmah, the first God image, the supernatural Father. Thus, in this text, Rashith has been interposed as an anagram for Rosh, who is understood to be the head God. Chokmah, could this be what Joseph means when he says, quote, a man, a Jew without authority, unquote, change the reading of the word. Perhaps by failing to understand this ancient Kabbalistic anagram? Now here Owens, of course, touches on what they do with their gematria, their numbers. Anybody comes along trying to sell you the greatness, the, the beauty of, the, uh, the natural core, uh, foundational uh, excellence of numbers is selling you Jewish mysticism like Marty Leeds 33 and all of his ilk. Finally, Smith translates Elohim in the plural as the gods. The word is indeed in a plural Hebrew form, but by the orthodox interpretive conventions, Joseph was taught in his Kirtland Hebrew class, which remained the norm, it is read as singular. In the Zohar, however, it is interpreted in the plural. This is witnessed throughout the Zohar, and apparently clearly in the following paragraph from the opening sections of the work, where the phrase, quote, let us make man, unquote, from Genesis 126, is used as the basis for a discussion on the plurality of gods. Here we go. Quote, us, unquote, certainly refers to two. Of which one said to the other above it, quote, let us make, unquote, nor did it do anything save with the permission and direction of the one above it, while the one above did nothing without consulting its colleague. But that which is called, quote, the cause above all causes, unquote, which has no superior or even equal, as it is written, quote, to whom shall ye liken me, that I should be equal, unquote, from Isaiah 40, 25, said, quote, see now that I, I am he, the Elohim is not with me, unquote, from who he should take counsel. With all the colleagues explained the word Elohim in this verse as referring to other gods. Within this passage is both the concept of plurality and a hierarchy of gods acting, quote, with the permission and direction of the one above it, while the one above it did nothing without consulting its colleague, unquote. This interpretation is, of course, echoed in the King Follett discourse and became a foundation for all subsequent Mormon theosophy. Now, since he's given that, <clears throat> And uh, we only have three paragraphs in this section, which I'm thankful for, because the, the point of this was the point I just raised. It's one or the other. And lest we dwell too much on how unquestioningly Kabbalistic uh, Smith's writings are here, and, and then just entirely forget about his uh, talisman that he wore on his person from an early age with Hebrew on it that, within its context, could again only be from a mystical origin, Kabbalah, the parchments daggers. Oh. Let us not forget those things. Let us not forget the possibility of his mother, Miss Mack Smith, and her father, Solomon Mack. And I've got a special little thing to throw in at the end here, and any of you who are listening and not watching, um, at the end I will leave it on the screen long enough for you to take a moment, look at your screen, and ponder. However, 
if I may add, not only is it um, as this man Zucker is is arguing, um, the Hebrew norm of context to consider that exactly as he said the clause um, as the Hebrew is pronounced Bereshit bara Elohim and then it would be um, at Shamaim at Eretz that's the whole phrase um, yeah that that is first off the except that if you want to go with say rabbinic Talmudic interpretation syntactically contextually yes and furthermore and this is this is where you have to see that it can only be one of the two options I gave you either Smith is this great pure prophet and he's just expressing archetype that was expressed 500 years earlier in Zohar or he of course pulled that directly from well Nybauer's copy of the Zohar because it's possible that Smith didn't have the same materials as folks like Nybauer and before Nybauer uh, his associate the uh, Bennett the pervert Mason I don't know why I'm calling Bennett a pervert I'm talking about Smith anyways the thing that you're gonna find is first off if you just consult the rest of Scripture you can just look at the Old Testament and you can see that it's really clear that Yahweh states over and again that he created alone no plurality of gods you can also see that even though the suffix ym yam can mean a plural in many contexts that it is always presented as a singular when speaking of Yahweh as Aliyim. Now, some people call this plurality of majesty. Um, and in my growing understanding of Obri, not Hebrew, but you could even say this in a growing understanding of Hebrew, just as just Hebrew, just from the Masoretes, Hebrew, fine. That there are words, phrases, terminology that are emphatic. And when you see something like, let us make man in our image, first off, we have the burden of English translation expressing something. If he is speaking out loud, is he schizophrenic? Are there multiples speaking in unison? Well, contextually, I have never found it all that hard to understand that we are talking about a singular person whose title, Aliyim, whose name given to us, Yahweh, is speaking for perhaps actually speaking at the time, but for the benefit of the reader, in the only way that expressions of himself can be made concerning the way in which a singular plurality would have to express himself. Let us make man in our image. That's English. And in Hebrew, it would be expressed in a different way, and in Obri, a different way. However, that being said, again, the only other way that we see that clause being interpreted 
besides Smith's King Follett discourse, is in the Zohar. And, not deep within the heart of the Zohar, you could have cracked the first few pages and gotten it right from there. Now, continuing from Mr. Owens. Two months after giving the King Follett discourse, Joseph returned to these first Hebrew, Hebrew words of Genesis and the subject of plural gods. Thomas Bullock transcribed his remarks on the rainy Sunday morning of 16 June 1844. This was to be Joseph's last public proclamation on doctrine. Eleven days later, he lay dead. On the 27th day of the 6th month? That was me. He lay dead on the 27th day of the 6th month. Interesting. Joseph first introduced on 44, which I don't know as much about. I don't know as much the symbolism that these people put into their numbers. Um, I don't know that much about. First off, because I do know that they revere numbers as as grand symbols. They're not just a way to add, subtract, multiply, and divide to these people. That is why they have applied numbers in as a gematria to all the so-called Hebrew obery letters. There is never such thing. If you wanted a number, it was a word. Alep, Ahad, Shalash. It was a word. So I don't fully understand the way that they use and they twist their numbers because when you have to go after sets of knowledge like that, you can't help but having to encounter all kinds of their filthy ways of thinking in the process of gaining that knowledge. So it's something that I've had to only get in bits and pieces as I can, as I can stomach, as I go. But I do know that I have seen enough recurring numbers with these people to know that these things, it is, <clears throat> it is though they are utter slaves to these numbers. And as we saw in the uh, the commentary on from the Orthodox Jew concerning how they would um, interpret what they call Torah, um, numerology is certain certainly with within that set of of interpretations, um, and it, it seems to me that it is is far more augmented in Kabbalah, and none of these numbers are an accident. And it seems to me that they do a lot of their communicating through numbers. And as um, I don't believe it was Owens, but it was Gershon Scholin, I think, who had mentioned how, um, well, no, it might have been Owens anyways, that there was, um, that there was quite frequently going to be this esoteric use of numbers um, in creating anagrams and twisting those things. Um, and of course, even with those who may not know the first thing about Kabbalah, even the people who may not are still practicing this symbolic way of speaking in one way and meaning another. Duality. And numbers are used just for that end, too. So I don't think it's a mistake that either he was or were told he died on the day of the 27th, that's three nines, on the sixth month in 1844. 18 and 44. Who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. This was to be Joseph's last public proclamation on doctrine. Eleven days later, he lay dead. 
Joseph first introduced this subject, the plurality of gods, then again read it in Hebrew, the opening words of Genesis, and repeated his interpretation of Bereshith bara Elohim, using much of the same phrasing recorded two months earlier in the King Follett Discourse. He then turned to Genesis 1.26, quote, let us make man, unquote, the same passage interpreted in the Zohar to imply a plurality of gods. After reading the verse aloud in Hebrew, he interpreted the text and found it in the same occult import given by the Zohar, the God, quote, which has no superior or equal, unquote, and that's the Zohar's words, the, quote, head of the gods, and that's Joseph's term, addressed the, quote, other gods, or Elohim, in the plural translation, saying, quote, let us make man, unquote. Bullock transcribed his remarks thus. Quote, if we pursue the Hebrew further, it reads, here he apparently read it in Hebrew, the Genesis 1.26, the head one of the gods said, let us make man in our image. In the very beginning, there is a plurality of gods beyond power of refutation. It is a great subject I am dwelling on. The word Elohim ought to be in the plural all the way through. As he began his exegesis of the opening Hebrew phrase of Genesis in the King Follett Discourse, Joseph stated that he would go on to the, quote, Old Bible. In Kabbalistic lore, the commentary of the Zohar represented the oldest biblical interpretation, the secret interpretation imparted by God to Adam and all worthy prophets after him. Joseph certainly was not using the knowledge of Hebrew imparted to him in Kirkland nine years earlier, when he gave his exegesis of Bereshith bara Elohim, or plural interpretation of Elohim. Was then the, quote, old Bible he used, the Zohar? And was the, quote, learned man of God that he mentioned, Simeon ben Yochai, the prophetic teacher attributed with these words of the Zohar? Joseph wove Hebrew into several of his discourses during the final year of his life. In these late Nauvoo discourses, however, he interpreted the Hebrew not as a linguist, but as a Kabbalist, a reflection of his own predilections and the fortuitous aid of his tutor, Alexander Nybauer. But in conclusion, we need to step back from this discussion of words and see that behind them resides a unique vision, a vision characteristic of the occult hermetic Kabbalistic tradition. Harold Bloom called the King Follett Discourse, quote, one of the truly remarkable sermons ever preached in America, unquote. It is also a remarkable evidence of the prophet's visionary ties to the archaic legacy of Jewish Gnosticism and to the single most influential force in the evolution of Christian occultism, the Kabbalah. Now that finishes his section on the King Follett Discourse. I have just a few things to say now that that is done. So, what happened then, Mr. Owens, to Joe Smith, the great and pure prophet, simply articulating archetypes when you revert back to clearly illustrating his tutelage under men like Nybauer? or earlier than that, in Kirtland, and you follow his progress. You see, it seems to me that Owens is playing any side he can play, being as talented as he is, and perhaps how easily influenced so many LDS are by someone who is just a authorized expositor, writer, so-called prophet, bishop, executor of their organization. 
I don't know. I do know this. Bloom, who we just mentioned, Bloom wrote a book that I'm still trying to track. So I just need to get, I think, a few key things out of it. I am unable to get any kind of PDF, EPUB uh, copy of another book that is going to be monumentally important in this <clears throat> uh, entire series and where we need to go with it after this. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to get a hold of that either. But, uh, for instance, the guy that they called D. Michael Quinn, who they say uh, is an apostate that they excommunicated, and he wrote what they critically got a lot of acclaim. Now, I'm starting to notice some very strange patterns, as I mentioned earlier, in those people who are said to be heretics, excommunicated, or willing excommunicates, uh, dissenters against the church, or just Smith, or just Young. I mean, my goodness, people. The complications, the confusions, the mess of secrecy and insanity that I'm trying to weed through is gargantuan. Now, uh, D. Michael Quinn's three books set on the history, various histories concerning Mormonism, what I found odd about it with as much and it's interesting. Wikipedia, I go to Wikipedia all the time. I read Wikipedia's, their entries all the time. I've got three up right now. I got one on communism, one on the Nauvoo Legion, and one on Nauvoo, Illinois. And I read those. And I have to glean. Wikipedia is one of those things that you can glean multiple things from. First off, the information that is benign. You can relatively count on. So there's benign sets of informative facts that you usually don't have to look at so much sideways. Then you look at the spin. Wikipedia is is a spin uh, tool. So if you can pay attention to the spin, you can extract a lot from what you're reading, depending on the subject. Um, and you can see they're controlling the narrative. So how are they? What are they leaving out? This is what's monumentally important. Because Wikipedia is a good tool for people researching. It's not a good tool in the sense that you need to believe everything you see there. Just like I said. But the thing on D. Michael Quinn and the stuff they said about him and how they sort of generate a picture of him and how he's supposed to be so damaging, damaging to Mormonism. However, if you go to Amazon, you can get that three book set for just over $100. Each book, if you bought them individually, about um, 30 something bucks. Not bad when you consider the fact that Nadia Abu al Hajj's Facts on the Ground, which almost got her fired, even being like, at the time, I think she was darn near tenured at Columbia, New York, because she was disproving that there was any real solid archaeological evidence that linked the Jews to Palestine. That book, you're going to pay through the nose to get, and there's not many copies usually available. However, D. Michael Quinn's, there's plenty of copies. You could get the three books set for just over $100. Um... There are a few other books in PDF or um, EPUB and um, 
I think I'm going to have to reinstall the EPUB reader on oh, my computer. That is so pathetic. <clears throat> um, because there's points of history here. Some of the most important, I think, have been brought out recently, like within the last few years, and you have to ask questions. I don't have the answers yet, but why? For instance, all of these minutes concerning this thing called the Council of Fifty and what was happening in Nauvoo, and many things that happened before that in a militaristic way, were to a degree um, put in a book by a guy who claimed to be a an ex-Mormon or at least a, a disgruntled Mormon historian. Um, <clears throat> let's see, by the name of Grant H. Palmer. And after listening to enough Grant H. Palmer, I think... Uh, there's a lot of duality in Palmer. Uh, however, the big uh, hubaloo about Palmer was that he recorded a lot concerning this Council of Fifty, their, uh, their minutes that he said had disappeared for many years and then reemerged, uh, and they're trying to find land out west and he said some of the, um, l let's call them, they would call them seditious activities. And again, I don't know that I entirely trust that narrative either. But within it, I think we're going to see a better picture of the story of what went on and why. Out west, at this time, the bigger picture, which is much, much, much bigger than you might think. Um, so you have to wonder, this King Follett discourse, which a guy like, uh, a historian like Bloom, who is said to have wrote one of the quintessential works on the Mormon Church, I believe he's the one who wrote the book The American Religion, Bloom, you can check out the etymology of the name Bloom. He called the King Follett Discourse one of the most important sermons delivered in America ever. And you have to wonder, the more that we find out, the more that I can't help but think, was this really just a was this really just a sermon by whether you want to call him a prophet or profane? Um, to advance the um, the new purity, the getting back to the old uh, pure ways of understanding and religion as he put it, as so many of their apologists put it. Was this a great sermon in, in that context, or was that a great rallying cry to the Elohim, the troops? Hopefully these are the kinds of things that we're going to see as we go, and no matter what else, is uncovered that uh, we're able to understand uh, I hope really in all things may we accomplish this that just like Yusho spoke in Luke 8 21 that we all do as, as he wished that the crowds around him or at least those he had chosen would be his true family in that we hear the words of Yahweh and we perform them. So, till next time, fair 
well. And, and, since I almost forgot, I did forget, and I had to edit this back in after I almost had the whole thing ready to go. I promised to show you an image that I'm going to leave on the screen. Now, I have one on the screen right now, so you need to look at it right now. It has uh, two photos there. It, it, the top one is supposed to be the original death mask of Joseph and Hiram Smith. Joseph on the left, um, Hiram on the right. Again, Hiram was not your common uh, Anglo-European name either, folks. Okay. Now that is these are the masks at LDS.org. That image you're seeing, that is what they officially display on the screen. And then you can see them below. They have made a, a real pretty copies of them below. Right, Joseph, left, Hiram. Okay. Now, folks, I'm gonna let you decide how sanitized not only the claimed original death, death masks are, but just how accurate any of the beautiful paintings that we've seen of Smith down through the years are. I found a book called, um, I believe it's Mormon, uh, let's see, Mormon Portraits, some, not portrait, but it 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 was a German author in the 1880s that wrote these things about Smith, Young, Mormonism. Really interesting things. And when you look at the the quotes at the beginning of this book, there's there's not some punches held. 1880s he managed to do this. And what's fascinating, as I was scrolling through these old yellowed pages, uh, at the very beginning of the book, I came across two um, angles of the death mask of Joseph Smith that I'm going to put up on screen. And I want you to look at them. And I want you to ask yourself, do these first off look like any of the... And I know it's a death mask, okay? So don't anybody get on and say, oh, it's a death mask. I know it's a death mask, okay? A death mask or the way in which the the muscles on your face would go limp, I understand that. It wouldn't change your bone structure. So take a look, and you tell me, does this look like anything, A, that we've seen in renditions of Smith, A, and B, does it make you further question his, uh, how should I say it, mitochondrial DNA? And that, at that point, I'll leave this image on the screen for at least a few more seconds so that you can pause it and take a close look at it. But, uh, on that note, now I bid you fair well.